Hello, I am Freya Murray, Creative Lead at Google Arts and Culture Lab, and welcome to our Q&A session on diving into an acidifying ocean, an artwork by Christina Tarkini that launched on World Environment Day this year with the UN Climate Change as part of a Google Arts and Culture Lab residency program called Heartbeat of the Earth, a series of experimental artworks inspired by climate data. With me today is digital artist Christina Tarkini and scientist Frédéric Gazot, who will share their insights of working together. You are invited to dive into the ocean and witness the devastating effects that global rising temperatures are having on marine life. From pre-industrial revolution to 2100, we explore the devastating effects CO2 levels are having on ocean animals and species. Corals bleaching, fish disappearing, shells dissolving and jellyfish booming, and a new breed of sea creature that starts to populate our oceans. Thanks for joining me, Christina and Frederic. Christina, could you start by telling us um, a bit more about your artwork? Um, thank you, Freya, for the introduction. Yes, my name is Christina Tarquini, and I'm going to talk a bit about diving into an acidifying ocean. So diving into an acidifying ocean is a data visualization project uh, on climate change and that focuses especially on the oceans. Um, the data sets that are used comes from the WMO and IPCC reports of 2019 and two specific data sets from NOAA on pH and CO2 which we'll talk about in a second. So basically, uh, as Freya mentioned, since the Industrial Revolution, we've uh, released tons and tons of uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide, or CO2, is, is partly absorbed by the ocean. Uh, during this process, the, it, the CO2 interacts with the molecules of the, ocean, of the water, changes it, changing its chemistry. Um, this change can be seen through uh, via the pH, which is a scale that determines how basic or acidic uh, a liquid is. And in the ocean today, since the Industrial Revolution, the pH is lowered by 0.1 pH units, which is, seems to be nothing because it's a, such a tiny uh, number, but actually has huge consequences. In fact, in humans, a drop of 0.1 pH units can cause coma, seizures, or even death. So you can only imagine the dramatic effects on marine life. So this is uh, what the project talks about. The journey starts, as you see here, starts above the ocean and the users dives deep under the, su the surface to encounter marine animals as well as anthropocentric or at least what I call anthropocentric animals. Um, so let's, let's, let's start the experience. Every second breath we take comes from the ocean. But this won't be for much longer. We're in the process of killing 96% of ocean life. Two hundred fifty-two million years ago, in an event known as the Great Dying, a massive release of carbon dioxide, CO2 and other gases caused extreme global warming, depleting the oceans of oxygen and acidifying the waters. Today we are causing the same process to happen at a speed that surpasses that of the great dying by tens of thousands of years. Back then life returned after 10 million years. If we fail to act, what will happen to ocean life? And to us? So after this little intro that sets the story, the user starts encountering the different animals um, placed on a timeline, as you see here. So let's start with this animal here. 
So this is a theropod. Uh, this is a, was a bit the entry point for me on uh, acidifying ocean because I discovered this study that shows that when pteropods are placed in water with the same pH levels and CO2 that are projected for the year 2100, the shells start decaying within 48 hours and nearly completely dissolve within 45 days. I, this is exactly what you saw here. In fact, all the animations uh, are an interpretation of some photographs that I, dis that I found in this study that shows, they showed images of different stages uh, over time. For example, a 48 hours, a 45 days of the dissolution and the morphing of the shell of the sea. So I use this photograph to inform, uh, to inform the, the animation that you see in this experience. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, we will be moving through time from 1860 to 2100, as these are the, the projection and the data available with the NOAA's data sets. The, the data sets can also be found here, the planet's temperature increase, the ocean's pH acidity increment, and ocean CO2 intake, and ocean oxygen loss. So, um, all of this it's all the data can be seen here can be seen in the ocean we'll see you later on and it's in the in the stories of the animal scrolling through the timeline i can move and then come oh i can move through times and encounter different animals um for example let's 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 get this one so this is a, a phytoplankton which is super key for, extremely key for the food chain as uh, you know they, they give us every second breath we take basically. The look that you see that now this is happening with the dissolution we talked about earlier, it's a point cloud look which um, which resembles the real look of the of the of the animals uh, itself we opted for a realistic look because we wanted to because i wanted to make sure that the user would really um would really come close and really empath empathize with the animals um so as one third almost one third of carbon dioxide co2 is absorbed by the world's ocean this acidifies the water through a chemical process called ocean acidification this chemical process degrades our ocean's pH, its level of acidity, which has deadly consequences for much of marine life. Shells and skeletons dissolve, and marine animals' physiology changes. The animals encountered so far form the foundation of the marine food web and represents the future of the oceans. But due to the dramatic changes taking place, they are also the ones suffering the most. So as, as we said, we, we first encountered the animals that were at the bottom of the food web, which actually sustain much of marine life. And over time, we will go up and up the food chain to understand a bit better what happened. And as you can see, we are now moving in the ocean with this sort of point cloud look that is a very realistic look, but allows us to do this, um, this solution animation um, that we discussed earlier. For example, here a shell, healthy aragonite saturation state to ship between 3 and 4 ohm, but around the world it has already fallen by 1 ohm. If it continues to fall to below one arm, all skeletons of shell will start to solver. So basically, the aragonite saturation states talk about the minerals that form um, the, the shells and skeleton, and it gives us a quantity that's presented in the water. And this is what is uh, coming to life. So as the users move through the ocean, encounters all these different uh, animals, we can start to see these red swirls in the oceans, which are a bit my interpretation, let's say artistic interpretation, of how this uh, acidification is starting to appear in the sea and it started to eventually uh, affect animals. So now we're going up the food chain and we're, we're discovering uh, different little animals. So, um, 
these animals have been... The oceans absorb around 30% of the carbon dioxide CO2 that is released in the atmosphere. Since 1860, the ocean's pH has fallen by 0.1 pH units from 8.2 to 8.1 pH. What seems like a small change of 0.1 actually means that today the oceans are 30% more acidic. In humans, a drop of 0.1 pH units in the blood can result in seizure, coma, or even death. If we continue at this pace, by 2100, oceans will be 170% more acidic, falling to a pH of around 7.6. Let's consider the huge consequences. Ocean acidification can precipitate ecological collapse. Research has shown that 66 million years ago, a drop in pH of 0.25 was enough to precipitate another mass extinction. And it was hundreds of thousands of years before life returned to normal. So um, this, this uh, point cloud look has been created uh, well, the first animals was created by a process called photogrammetry. So I used a shell that I found on the beach um, and I scanned it. I took loads of pictures of it. This uh, photos turned into a... Uh, I put them into a software which created a 3D model of it. And then with a, the software that we created, we transformed this 3D model into point clouds. After all, we uh, eventually, we didn't create all the animals uh, like this because uh, it was quite hard to find all the animals <laughs> on the beach, let's say. So we we just created 3D models, and uh, yeah, and then we donated with this bespoke software. We created this this point cloud look. As you started to see, the ocean is um, not fully blue anymore, but it started to become a bit yellow because the, the color of the ocean is highly dependent on the increase of uh, pH. Um, as we go over time, the pH is going to reach 170% more acidic in 2100, and the ocean will start becoming from blue uh, more and more red, like these little squirrels moving in the sea. So this is an example of an anthropocentric animal. For example, a ghost net. Ghost net is a is a is a net that has been abandoned in the sea. And on average, these nets entangle and harm between 30 to 40 marine animals per net when left in the ocean. So this is not fish that will feed anybody. It's just uh, there to die because somebody forgot a net. As we go. Over, over time and we go up the food chain, we start discovering that the seas are less and less populated with fish and more and more populated with these uh, anthropocentric animals, which are just taking over the seas. With overfishing, pollution and climate changing, we are removing the fish from the sea and we are in inserting all these um, these objects that are, do not normally belong there. Yeah, thanks so much for taking us through. Um, it's, you know, beautiful in one sense and, of course, um, concerning um, narrative, um, but that you presented in a, a beautiful and really engaging way. Um, so for, um, before I just we will move on now to the Q&A and, um, you know, really thrilled to have you both um, here with us today. Um, so, Christina, so you're a digital visual artist um, who works at the intersection of visual arts and new technologies um, with a practice that focuses on visual communication and immersive experiences. Um, Christina's worked with studios such as Marshmallow Laser Feast and the Future Centre Europe and has exhibited at Somerset House. And on diving into acidifying oceans, um, Christina worked with a um, marine biologist and biogeochemist, Frederick, um, who has expertise on coastal, meta um, 
metabolism, effects on ocean acidification and warming on various marine organisms and on the use of techniques to study the effects of these anthropogenic pressures on marine communities in this field. Um, I'd love to, um, to start with um, Christina, is um, just to hear from you about, you know, what made you decide to create a project that was um, looked at our acidifying oceans? Yeah, so basically I've, I've been quite fascinated with the oceans for quite some time now. But the thing is that um, regardless of climate change, pollution, overfishing, to us, to us, the ocean is always appears this blue mirror-like, perfect for sunsets kind of surface, and it's really hard to see under the surface and really understand what's happening. Um, so I did a lot of research on on the oceans in general, and <clears throat> sorry, and when I discovered uh, that they were acidifying at such an alarming rate, and the, the when I discovered the effects that this change was having, uh, that was so dramatic on mar marine life, I was surprised at first I didn't know about it before, and then that it wasn't common knowledge yet. So for me, this was a red flag that really just quickly made me choose that this was the the, the topic uh, that I had to choose for the for this project. Frederick, um, it, in terms of it'd be great to I know you worked with Christina on this um, project. Um, what's your what's your main research um, focus? Yes, uh, hello. So as as you said, I'm a marine biologist. Um, I've been studying for my for my PhD thesis uh, how the, the coastal ecosystems work mm -hmm. in terms of primary production, in terms of community respiration, how the bacteria and the animals are using the organic matter that is produced by the plants, and microalgae, and so on. And uh, in the, at the start of the 2000s, I realized that uh, ocean acidification was uh, an issue, definitely for marine life. And I started to work on, on this topic on bivalves. And um, I've been working with uh, the National uh, Center for Scientific Research in France for about 10 years. And since, since then, I'm working on developing techniques and uh, experimental protocols to study ocean acidification as close as possible to um, field conditions. Meaning that we don't take an organism, we put it in a beaker and we try to change the pH and we see what are the effects, we try to be as realistic as possible. That's our main goal uh, in the last few years. And um, uh, Christina, yes, um, you know, you brilliantly um, visualize, um, visualize this process in a really engaging way. What, um, what was the process to find and collect the data um, I know you mentioned the the shell um, close to your home, but in ter um, as a starting point um, from the visual side, but in terms of the hard data, where is it mainly from? And um, yeah, how did you approach this? Yeah, so <clears throat> two of the main data which are on the about the pH and the absorption of CO2 are from NOAA, which is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And uh, they basically gathered data uh, globally and did projection from 60 to 2100. This is why I chose this specific timing for, for the experience. And I um, supported this with data from the IPCC and WMO um, reports of 2019. Um, to, to accompany all this, though, I had to do lots of research on each individual animal which was basically reading loads and loads and loads of scientific paper and trying to understand them by not being a scientist. Uh, so it, it was quite, uh, it took me quite a lot of time. Um, but then, in fact, it, so basically what I did with after was to collate all the all these uh, elements together, do some uh, some edit, uh, editing, some summary, and uh, make sure that actually I could translate this difficult vocabulary into something that could be understood by everybody. But then it was very key to work with Frederick because uh, uh, because of this. this to make sure that eventually what was said was scientifically true 
And uh, um, yes, so this is how then eventually all the content, all the data came together. I was going to ask actually, how did um, you both, how did you meet um, so Christina and Frederick? I basically sent him an email. It was very, very out of the blue. I was, uh, I was, I did. Yeah, I was looking for a scientist that could that could help me, and I basically I discovered this entire world of ocean, ac ocean acidification. I discovered loads of information ex exchange point, and uh, yeah, and uh, Frederick was uh, the the amazing scientist that replied to me. That was willing to read through uh, loads of papers, loads of pages, and uh, and help. Thanks again. In fact. <laughs> Thank you, Frederick. Um, yeah, we were thrilled to have you as part of this um, project. Um, you, what potential do you see for um, art and science to come together and enable communication about your research? I think it's a really great tool, definitely. We need to have all the tools that we have at hand, you know, to communicate about this problem and to make the general public aware of this situation and art is definitely something that uh, we are looking for and we are doing over other projects and besides the one of uh, Christina we are collaborating for, with uh, many artists uh, to show and to be able to exhibit uh, our science to schools or I don't know exhibitions for, for instance in museums here close to Villefranche in Monaco uh, that's something we do quite a lot and I think it's a it's a really great tool that will be uh, I hope more and more used in the coming years you know, to help us communicate on that. Yeah, yeah. I agree. And uh, what, in terms of uh, so our acidifying oceans, what what steps do you think we should be doing as individuals? If people listening to this are thinking, well, what what can I do um, to slow this process down? What would you advise, or what do you advise? I'm sure you're asked this question a lot. Definitely, and I changed my way of life as well. I try, I try. So there are many, many things we can say about this. Uh, we are part of a problem. Uh, it's not we cannot think that uh, our societies are responsible for that. We are part of the societies, and we are the consumers. So if we want to change things, we we cannot ask only our governments to do things. We have to do things ourselves. That's really important. So there's no no right. Uh, behavior uh, to adopt there are some small steps as you said that we can we can do maybe not all of us uh, for instance we try to to travel a bit less we try to travel less with planes and we try to take the train whenever it's possible it's a scientist that, that is saying that that needs to travel quite a lot you know to go to conference uh, overseas and but we try to, to change that uh, um, as we can um, I'm a vegetarian for two years now. I'm just talking about my personal life. Yeah. And uh, it has been a quite difficult uh, thing to, for me to do because I love eating meat, definitely. Uh, but that's something uh, I decided to do because I realized that growing uh, cows and pigs and so on is something like 40% of our emissions, of our CO2 emissions, if you count the transport, if you count the production of, uh, of cereals and so on to feed them. So there are many, many small things you can buy local only. You decide that you go to the supermarket and when they offer you uh, apples uh, from uh, the other side of the world, you say, no, I will buy something that will be maybe a bit more expensive, definitely, but local. Mm -hmm. uh, try to limit our, our consumption of things. You don't need to change your phone every year. That's what I say. I, I go to school to teach about acidification. That's what I say. And I'm always afraid when they when I ask the question, how many times, or how, how often you change your phone? And sometimes that, sometimes it's every year. And uh, you see, why do you have to change your phone every year? So we can change many, many things. Yeah. You know, uh, we, are, we are the actors here. And I think that's something that I'm you know, can be hard to, as, when you're thinking about buying a new phone or thinking about eating meat and in terms of the small individual things that we can do, is then thinking that in the context of our oceans. Because, you know, we think about, um, you know, I, I know I think about CO, um, you know, my carbon footprint, et cetera. But I, um, before this project with Christina, I hadn't thought in depth about its impact specifically on um, our on oceans and the acidification and um, that's happening with um, our oceans. Um, and I think um, it's one of these, um, also I think with some climate data, um, 
it can be quite intangible. Um, and how and I know the a one of the aims of this um, program, Heartbeat of the Earth, was um, to support artists in terms of um, making some intangible data more tangible and that emotional connection. Um, and Chris, mm -hmm. what role do you think artists um, can play um, in communicating? Um, complex um, issues that our planet planet faces. Yeah, I think this uh, this project is very specific for this because, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I had to read a lot of research paper uh, papers, and it was quite hard sometimes for me to understand it because there was a lot of specific technical uh, language, or uh, it it was very it wasn't so easily digestible for me. So I think. Um, uh, yeah, so when when non-scientists, let's say, uh, really see these complex world issues, it's really hard to grasp to grasp them, to really understand them uh, properly. And I think the role of artists, designers, communication in general should be to try and um, summarize or like package all this complex content in a way that is easily digestible for everybody. And uh, yeah, so I think that this was key, for example, in this proje project to uh, make sure that the data was accessible, the uh, understandable by people, and was visually appealing also because any any experience has to entertain, and therefore uh, audiences could then really understand and engage with the problem. Thank you. And I know, Christina, you had some um, questions you wanted to um, ask Frederic while we're um, um, here today. So um, I'll sit back and please um, go ahead. Yes, 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 please. Thank you. So um, yeah. again, on the on the scientific papers. So the scientific papers I had the chance to read quite dramatic clear negative future for certain marine animals um, and I on the other hand though I also encountered very uh, many uh, scientific exchange points as the topic seems quite uh, popular among scientists uh, but why do you think this topic is not so popular among non-scientists why do you think there is not so much communication about it yeah it's it's a quite difficult question to answer but I will try um, I think the main reason is that uh, the process is a bit more complex than global warming. Global warming, you know, that it's CO2 that is increasing the, the, um, the temperatures on the, the surface of the Earth. It's pretty, pretty easy to understand. And also, global warming is something that people can feel. So maybe not on a year-to-year -year basis, because we're talking about weather forecast here, but and I don't know if you hear old people saying that 50 years ago, oh, we could grow this uh, vegetable, we could do that, and now we cannot do it anymore. So it's really visible to people. So it's really a uh, knowledge that is easier, I think, to access for people. Ocean acidification, we don't live in the ocean. It's far away. Uh, we don't know what uh, bivalve uh, oysters, uh, fish experience, and it's it's far from us. So we it's difficult for the people to to understand, you know, this complex issue of ocean acidification due to CO2. CO2 is an acid gas. It's changing the pH of the ocean. Then it's changing the chemistry of the ocean, and this has effect on organisms and communities and ecosystems. This, this is much more complex. That's maybe why the media are not so keen on talking about this, or certainly less than uh, global warming. They talk about it huh? you, when you read the newspapers, but it's sometimes quite uh, a lot just after the release of an IPCC report and after we don't talk about it for some years. So that, I think that's the main reason. Global warming is way closer to our lives than ocean education. <coughs> Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it was close. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. It's it's. I I totally agree. Like also when I was uh, uh, doing my research, I was this. I was really th thinking of the ocean as a bit of a, like an alien world because I would never be able to survive there. It's hard to imagine that this this animal can breathe underwater. They can do all these different things. They have physiologies that are completely different from us. So I totally agree with what you say. And yeah, it's a very complex topic. <laughs> 
Uh, so another question, can you please give us an overview of what will happen in the food chain once marine animals will be more and more affected by ocean acidification? For example, what will happen once pteropod, the, the little shells we encounter in the, in the experience, won't be able to form their shells anymore? This is also a really hard question to answer. <laughs> we know that theropods will be negatively impacted by ocean acidification. We have, I think, the first study that has been published was in 2005 or something like this. So we know this is an issue for these species because especially they live in uh, high latitudes. So they live in the North Atlantic and the North Pacific, especially. We can, we can find them everywhere, but they live in, with high biomass. In, this, in these regions, and these will be the regions that will be the most impacted by ocean acidification in the coming decades. Because there's just a simple physical chemical process is that CO2, like other, all other gases, dissolve much better in cold water than in hot water. So you will have much more CO2 entering the high latitudes than the low latitudes. So these organisms will definitely be impacted. We know that. Now, what will be the effect on the on the food chain and on the, the predators, the whales, the, the salmons, the tuna, and so on. This is really hard to project. Only models can uh, can help us doing this. And this is not the only problem that we that we face. Uh, there will be less pteropods, but certainly there will be also less phytoplankton. So that's something we will. So that's really the base uh, of the food chain. So only models, and for the moment, they are not really well constrained. So we cannot really have clear answers on that, on how will be uh, the effect. Definitely that, that will be negative, but how much, we don't know. We can imagine that pteropods will be replaced by another species that doesn't grow a shell. You know, we have sometimes copepods that are not building cal calcium carbonate uh, shells, that might take the, the ecolo ecological niche of uh, pteropods and that they will be able to feed as much as theropods were doing. And for the moment, we don't really know. And uh, I hope in the next uh, 10 years or 20 years, we will be able to have a better answer that I could give now. <laughs> okay. oh, we lost Christina, no. <clears throat> yeah, <fair. laughs> So yeah, yes, bad connection today, sorry. Um, of these questions, are there any key animals that are very tribal for ocean, ocean acidification? Yeah, as you say in your, in your project, the, the animals that produce calcium carbonate, so calcareous uh, shells or skeletons are certainly the ones that would suffer the most. And uh, from these organisms, we think about corals, for instance, that are not only impacted by acidification, unfortunately, but also a lot by global warming and the increase in the frequencies of heat waves. Uh, you know that uh, two years ago, we lost a large part of, uh, of the Great Barrier Reef, reef. so that's, uh, that's a big issue, definitely. Bivalves are mm -hmm. among the ones that also that will be uh, really impacted. And bivalves, I mean oysters, mussels, and clams, and so on, everything you discussed in your project before. This is a real problem because it's, uh, it's an important economic uh, revenue for human societies and coastal societies rely a lot on, uh, on bivalve fisheries or aquaculture. So that's a big problem for us, not only for the bivalves. Uh, what, what mm -hmm. we, we can think of other uh, calcareous organisms like sea urchins uh, that could be impacted as well. And there are, we know now that even fishes we were not believing it at, at the start, but it's apparently a scientific fact that fishes are impacted by ocean acidification. The change in the tiny changes in pH are able to modify the way they sense their environment. And uh, we know from working on Nemo, for instance, you know, the small uh, clown, <laughs> that uh, this fish is not able to, uh, to escape predators or go back to the anemonia uh, as easy as it could, it could do uh, when you change the pH. So, pH can have many uh, diverse effects on marine, uh, marine uh, organisms and ecosystems. So definitely for me, corals are certainly the most impacted ones, and especially because of global warming and also acidification. I was surprised to learn that space funding in 2013 outpaced ocean exploration 150 to 1. It's mind-blowing. And then we actually have laid eyes 
on less than 5% of the oceans. So we basically know better Mars almost than, than our oceans. So in an ideal like scenario, what would be your next research project and what would you like to discover of the oceans? Definitely, if we want to know what will be the ocean of the future, we need to know what is the actual ocean. And we still don't know it. That's the big problem. Uh, of course, we will need an international effort to do that. If we are not even able to do that at the European level, so that will be a first start. But then we can think about having an international effort to run expeditions, you know, to try to discover our oceans. Now we have we have great tools at hand. We have uh, these autonomous platforms that you can send in the sea, and you know, you heard about the Argo uh, platforms that measure temperature. Now we can equip these uh, platforms with uh, oxygen, pH, nutrients, and many other parameters, so we can have a better view on uh, what is actually in, in our oceans. Uh, with respect to not discovering our ocean anymore, uh, but um, try to have uh, experiments that are relevant, that's what I said before. We have to think about all these issues long term, large scale, large pressure scale, uh, lots of replication, and that that means lots of money. <laughs> lots yeah. of money. And uh, for this, I'm not in the political world, so I don't know exactly what we should do to convince our governments to give more. But uh, let's hope it will, uh, it will get better in the, in the future. We will not be able to compete with, um, with space science, definitely. We don't, we don't send probes for uh, our satellites for 10 or 20 years. Uh, that's not what we do, so it's less costly. But uh, sh we should yeah, be able to change a bit the ratio between the two types of science, for sure. Yes, definitely. I agree. <laughs> thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Frederic, and thank you, Christina. And um, yeah, I, um, I I look forward to seeing um, hopefully new future projects and collaborations between um, the two of you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you to the SDG Global Festival of Action for inviting us and to everyone for joining us today. If you head over to our exhibit booth, you can discover two um, other artworks that explore topics such as CO2 emissions stemming from the food we eat to inviting you to explore predicted global rising sea levels, both part of our Heartbeat of the Earth programme in collaboration um, with three brilliant artists and the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. You can also explore more at g.co forward slash heartbeat of the earth. Thank you. <laughs>